Father, we are blown away with the grace and the mercy that you have bestowed upon us in sending your son into this world to die for us. And Father, I just ask and pray as we continue in this series, the declaration of Christmas, Father, I pray that you would speak in such a powerful way this morning. Again, Father, just so reminded of the fact that we don't need to hear from me. Father, we need to hear from you. And I pray as we continue in this series, Lord, as, we've, as, we, uh, as we look at this morning, as we look at Shout It Out, God, I pray that we truly would be a people who desire, who love, and who will proclaim your message. Father, I thank you so much for the privilege of being able to be together. And Lord, I just ask and pray once again that you would lead us during this time together. Thank you again for who you are, and thank you for this glorious night when the Savior of the world was born. And so, Father, we just commit this time into your hands, and we pray this in your name. Amen. If you've got your Bibles with you this morning, I want to invite you to turn with me to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, looking at verses 17 to 20. And I uh, want to thank Brad and Alyssa for leading us this morning in, in singing. And Brad, I was kind of concerned on where you were going with half of your comments this morning, but I appreciate the introduction to our message this morning that we've entitled Shout It Out. And we conclude our Advent series this year as we look at the topic of the declaration of Christmas. And if you've been with us over the last couple of weeks, you remember that we began this series by looking at the topic of that all creation declares. And we moved last Sunday to the fact that the angels declare. But the question that we're looking at this morning is, what are we declaring? What is it that we are desiring to proclaim to the world? And, and it's amazing because the shepherds come from seeing this amazing light, light up the sky. They get this encounter with this angel, and then they see the, they see the multitude of the heavenly host praising God. And you know, there's times that I read this passage that we're about to look at, And I begin to ask myself in my own heart, I begin to ask, where is this in my life? Where is the excitement of what God has done in me, in in proclaiming that message in my life? Or has it just become routine? You know, they see, again, as they, as they see this amazing light, as they see this miraculous miracle take place, and as they move, and as they see the baby... I love their response. They come to Bethlehem with haste. They see the baby, and what's their response? We just need to tell everybody about it. You know, look again, and as we read in in Luke chapter 2, verse 17 to 20, and here's, here's our main text this morning. Here's what Luke records for us. He says, and when they saw it, when they saw the baby, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who wondered, all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds were told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen as it had been told to them. You know, if, I don't know that there is a character in the Christmas story outside of Jesus that I love more than the shepherds. You know, I, I'm so fascinated for them because you think about the magnitude of God bringing this message to these people. Because this, they were, he was bringing his message not to the high class of society. He wasn't even bringing his message to the middle class of society. But rather, these were the despots of society. I mean, these guys weren't the superstars of the day. These guys were, these guys were ones that whose word wouldn't be taken in law because they were considered to be thieves. There were, these were the guys that wouldn't even be able to come into the temple for rituals because they were unclean. And yet these were the, these were the people that God decided to send his angels to, op- to share his message with. You know, I often think about Prince George. When Prince George was born a number of years ago, that William and Kate, when after, after the birth of Prince George, didn't proclaim the message only to, straight to the homeless. But no, they proclaimed it to kings and queens. They proclaimed it in this amazing celebration that took place in Buckingham Palace. They proclaimed it to the people. And yet, when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords was born, the lowliest of people received the message. 
God sent the angels to share with and share his great news with. And too many times, as I read this passage, too many times this story humbles me. But not because of the fact that God sent his message to the, to the lowliest of people, but the fact of the response of the shepherds to the message that they had been given. To the fact that with haste they ran to see what, was, what the angels were talking about. And too many times this story humbles me because I realize that there are too many times in my life that I fail to allow the impact of the gospel to lead me to proclaim it to the people around me. You know, and as I was preparing, as I was preparing for this message, I couldn't help but think of the, that great hymn, I Love to Tell the Story. Let me read the first verse in the chorus of this song, and here's what it says. It says, I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know tis true. It satisfies my longing as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story. Will be my theme and glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. You know, as I reflected on the words of that song, the thought that came over me was, am I waiting to heaven just to simply proclaim that message? Do I really love to tell the story? I mean, outside of the, outside of the fact that I, I mean, as I'm sure as I stand up here on a Sunday morning and share the message from the Word of God, but is this the only time that I proclaim the message of Christ, that I proclaim the gospel in my life? You know, let me, let me take it to all of us now. Are we truly in love with sharing the gospel? Are we truly in love with proclaiming the message of the Christ? Let me ask us this. Does it satisfy our longing as nothing else will do? You know, I, I picture the, I, I've been picturing this scene all week as, as, the, uh, as the shepherds come in to the stable, you know, and, and again, this is just going through my mind, I'm trying to visualize this, but I, I, picture the, I picture the shepherds coming into the stable and seeing Jesus in the manger, and just as the angel had said, and all of a sudden I see, I see one of the shepherds, or maybe all of the shepherds, I see this massive smile coming across their face. You know, as they're staring down, and, and as they're just looking at, at Jesus, and I wonder, maybe, maybe do they look at each other? And do they, does that smile get a little bit bigger? Maybe, maybe one of them maybe whispers or maybe says, it's just like the angel said so. And Mary and Joseph are looking at each other, kind of wondering, like, who, who are these people? Like, where did they come from, and, and what are they doing here? Right? But I would have loved, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall in the stable that night. To, see, to hear the conversation take place. But I have great confidence in the fact of what we have just read. I have great confidence in the fact that this conversation would have been pointing people back to God. You know, I, as I think of the shepherds, I can't help but reflect on another shepherd. A shepherd that loved to proclaim God. And the shepherd in the psalmist. In Psalm chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, where David says, I will give thanks to the Lord. With my whole heart, I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praises to your name, O Most High. Or a Psalm 97 verse, or sorry, Psalm 71 verse 15 that says, My mouth will tell of your righteous acts, of your deeds of salvation all the day, for their number is past my knowledge. In verse 16 it says, with the, right, with the mighty deeds of the Lord God, I will come. I will remind them of your righteousness. And here's what he adds at the end. Yours alone. I will remind them of your righteousness. Yours alone. Friends, we have looked at the fact that all of creation is declaring the message of Christmas. Or all of the creation is declaring the message of God. All of creation is pointing to the glory of God. The angels are crying out in worship of God. But as we close this last Sunday, we want, we, as we close last Sunday, we want to open with today. Are we joining in the declaration of the gospel? Are we joining in the proclamation of the good news of great joy that is for all people that the Savior of the world has come? Are we proclaiming the glory of God? Are we crying out in witness? Or would we say we like to tell the story as long as it's to our friends and our family who will totally agree with us? 
But I think of the words of Romans chapter 10, verse 14 to 15, when Paul writes these words, he says, How will they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. I promise you this right now, the shepherds would not have looked like a preacher. But their feet shone brightly as they proclaimed the good news of Jesus Christ. And so this morning we want to look in this final message as our tagline being, as, as we declare the message of Christmas, we move to point number one. As we declare the message of Christmas, we are his witnesses. As we move to the, as we, we declare the message of Christmas, we are his witnesses. As we come back to the story, see, again, I can totally see the shepherds just smiling away and standing in awe when finally someone says, it is just like they said, and the conversation is off and running. Because look at verse 17 again. Let me read verse 16 and then we'll lead into 17. And they went with haste and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it... They made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. They were blown away as they thought about the encounter with the angels. That this message was, that the message was being fulfilled, not partially how it had been told to them, but every part of what had been told to them was now true. And there wasn't anything that the angels said that wasn't complete. But they needed to make a choice to go and see. And so they come with haste. But then notice what they do. They proclaim. They come with haste and then they proclaim. I love it. Daryl Bach in his commentary on the book of Luke says, when he says these words, he says, they responded with obedience and cannot contain themselves from testifying to what God has done in making Jesus' presence evident to them. You know, I found it so interesting when, when Brad opened this morning and, and when he was praying, or when he, I can't remember if he were praying or he just said it this morning, but he said this, he says, uh, in, this, in that time, he said the, the, we, that we have the freedom to speak the name of Jesus. But are we going to do it? And then he said this, he says, even in the midst of opposition, we have freedom to speak the name because there's power in that name. Are we taking the opportunities? Like, I, I look at this I, I read this, I read this quote, and I think to myself, man, I've responded in obedience to the calling of Christ, to the gift of Christ, but is it, has it lost its luster to me? Has it lost its wonder? We're going to talk about that in just a second. Because the shepherds responded with obedience, but they could not contain themselves because they were so excited that Jesus made his presence evident, that God made his presence evident. Is that me? Is that you today? Are we so in awe? Are we so in wonder? Are we so excited that God in his great wisdom and his great mercy and his great love has made his presence known to us that we just can't stop telling people? Or has it just become routine to us? You know, I think about, as I think about the shepherds, it draws me to a story of another lady. And this lady, we, we read her story in John chapter 4. And in John chapter 4, uh, she, is one, she again is not the high class of society. She's not the middle class of society. In fact, the things that she's done in her life has brought so much shame on her that she doesn't even want to go out to the well to get water at the same time as other women because of the fact of how they look down upon her. And so we see again that Jesus is reaching out to the, to the despots of society, the lowliest of society. And Jesus begins this conversation with her about water and about offering her true and living water. And she, then he begins to, it begins to explain to her all that she's done in her life. And she's just blown away in this conversation. And all of a sudden the disciples return. And I want us to notice what she does. The disciples return. And in John chapter 4, verse 28 and 29, we read these. And so the woman left her water jar. I love that part. I love how we get so many details in Scripture. Because the woman, think about this for a minute. The woman left that which she came to get. Because she found something better. And so the woman left her water jar and went away into the town. And what does she do? She doesn't hide it to herself. She doesn't go back home. Just think, what does she do? She runs into the town and she says to the people, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. And then she asks this question, can this be the Christ? Can I have just had an encounter with God? Can I have, an enc have I had an encounter with Jesus? 
And I think about that lady, and I, and I think about the fact, and again, we see the impact of the presence of Christ that it has made in the life of an individual that drove them to share their story with the people around them. And I love the line in the song that we've just played. I love this line that says, the shepherds wondered. And what was the next line? They couldn't hide it. Told everyone in sight. And I wonder at times, why does it seem to fade as we journey with Christ? I continue to be amazed at the testimony of people who have been radically impacted by people who have just placed their faith in Jesus Christ and the passion that they have to see to tell everybody about what God has just done in their lives. And see, I wonder this Christmas season, is that our heartbeat? And we ask this question throughout the series on building the church. Are we passionate to see the lost of the world come to know Jesus Christ? And it's interesting because I find that there's, there's a number of people who will say, well, you know, I, I, I want to show people the love of Jesus. And I, and I think that's great. I think it's important, right? We need, we need to be showing people the love of Jesus. I need to show people what Jesus looks like. But friends, let me say this this morning. I believe that there are times that God is calling us to open our mouths. And I believe that God is calling us to proclaim his message once again. We cannot just be people who look like Jesus, but rather we need to be proclaimers of Jesus Christ. Again, I think of a statement that Daryl Bach said. He says, when God guides us through trials, our vocational crossroads, a decision involving our mate, our future, or our, our children, we should be prepared to speak about how he has impacted our lives. Let me take that one step further. How about the fact that Jesus Christ has brought you from death to life? We need to be proclaimers of the gospel. I think about back to what Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 7 says when, when God instructs the children of Israel how to teach their home and he says this, he says, you shall teach them diligently. He's talking about the commandments of God. He, you shall teach them diligently to your children. And what's that? And you shall what? Talk. Not just show, but you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Friends, there are too many times that as followers of Jesus Christ, we are not declaring the message of Christ because of the fear of man. And I'm not saying this to anybody else outside of myself right now. There are too many times that God, we are, we are praying, God, would you open the doors of opportunity? And when God opens that door, we go silent. I think again back to what, what, Moses, what God said to Moses in Exodus chapter 4 when he says, who has made man's mouth? You see, I think again, too, of, I, I, and this has this been my prayer this week as I've been preparing for this, this morning's message. I think of the words of, of Peter and John in Acts chapter 4. And, of course, in Acts chapter 4, they were, they were put in prison, and then they were commanded not to teach about God. And here's what he said. Here's, here's the response to that command in Acts chapter 4, verse 19 to 20. He says, whether it is right to, in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. You know, whether we have the freedom, as Brad talked about earlier, whether we have the freedom right now to be able to do that or whether we face opposition, this is my prayer for not only for my own life but for us as a church, that we would be a people who cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard about the gospel and about God. See, I remember, remember back to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and Jesus says to his apostles just before his return, he says to them, he says that, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. As Jesus called his apostles to be his witnesses, we are being given that same calling today. These shepherds were faithful to the declaration of Christmas, but are we learning to be like them? that we must be faithful to declare it again. That leads us to point number two, and point number two is this. As we declare the message of Christmas, we are reminded of the wonder. We are reminded of the wonder. As we continue in the story, look at we see this, the shepherds declare. Look at the response. I love the response so much. Verse, 19, verse 18 and 19. And all those who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. You know, the, um, as I read these two verses, I can't help but think of Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 to 10, Paul declares these words. He says, In him we have the redemption through his blood, 
the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to the purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in earth, things in heaven, and things on earth. I want us to think about this for just a moment. Let this just reflect in your heart and your mind right now. That God, God himself came into the world and took on your sin and took on my sin. And through him we have redemption. That God gave himself so that you and I could be free. And as the shepherds proclaimed their message, those who heard the message, and I'm thinking even the shepherds themselves, wondered at the message. For the Greek word wonder, I love this, I looked this up this week. The Greek word wonder literally means this. It literally means to admire, to regard with adoration, to be filled with wonder. That is what was taking place in the hearts of those who had heard the message of the shepherds. And again, it's, we think about it, it's still in the stable, right? Because we see verse 18, or we see verse 18, that and all who heard it wondered. This was, all in the, this was all in the stable. This was Mary and Joseph included. They heard what the shepherds were saying about what the angels had just told them, and it brought them to a place of wondering about this child, standing in awe, standing with ad- ad- admiration, standing in adoration of, of the child that they were now looking at. And I think again of, uh, I love the story in Luke chapter 2, a little later in Luke chapter 2, because uh, as Joseph and Mary bring Jesus to the temple, right, they walk into the temple and they see this man by the name of Simeon, and Simeon was given a promise by God that he would not die until he saw the Messiah. And as Simeon Simeon holds the baby and he's looking down at this baby, He's just in in awe and adoration of this baby, and he starts proclaiming Christ. And all of a sudden, we read again in Luke 2, 33, these words, that his mother and his father marveled at what was being said about him. You know, I often wonder to myself, you know, and I think about the song, Mary, Did You Know? I often wonder to myself, did Mary and Joseph really, like, did they have a clue what's happening right now? Like, all these different things, shepherds showing up, wise men coming with gifts, Simeon giving this blessing. Do they really comprehend, like, what is, what is my life going to look like for the next whatever number of years? You know, do they really know, do they really see who they're holding? And see, this is, this is my whole point this morning. Friends, I pray that the wonder of Christmas will never leave us. I pray that it, even, even as we go through this, you know, and as I was watching the kids practice this morning again, it was just so neat watching these kids just proclaiming the message of Christmas. So I want to encourage you, shameless plug again, be here tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. You're going to have fun doing it, but you're going to see a great message being proclaimed out of the mouths of babes and infants. And let's rejoice. Because, friends, I think too many times we're losing the wonder of Christmas. Because we are so caught up in the hustle and bustle. We are so caught up in going from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. And we're just going in circles. Can we stop for a moment? Right now. And ponder and wonder again the amazing gift of Christmas. Or that was given to us at Christmas. You know, I think of the words down here when they write the song, How Many Kings, and it's the chorus of the song says, How many kings step down from their thrones? How many lords have abandoned their homes? How many greats have become the least for me? How many gods have poured out their hearts to romance a world that's been torn all apart? How many fathers gave up their sons for me? Only one did that. See, again, we're reminded from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Friends, I pray that we will not lose the wonder of Christmas this year. That we are standing in awe of the fact that God stepped into the world and gave himself to us so that we can be saved. But I pray that that wonder would drive us to declaration. You know, I think about what the words of A.W. Tozer when he says these words. He says, the eternal son came to tell us what the silence never told us. He came to tell us what not even Moses could tell us. He came to tell us and to show us that God loves us and constantly cares for us. He came to tell us that God has a gracious plan and that he is carrying out that plan. Does this leave us in wonder? 
but does it leave us to ponder? Look at Mary, what Mary's response is in verse 19. But Mary pondered all these things treasure and tre- up in her heart and treasured them up in her heart. They were, she was treasuring them. She was putting them in her heart and she was thinking about these things. And I, I wonder as Mary listened, was listening to the words of the shepherds, what was going through her mind? You know, this was not the only time that Mary, we see this verse about Mary. Because at the end of Luke chapter 2, Jesus, uh, Mary and Joseph are returning home. And of course we know the story where Mary and Joseph return home from Jerusalem. And uh, Jesus still remains. And they, uh, we don't know how long it was into their journey. Then when all of a sudden they realized, okay, our son is gone. And they trace him all the way back to Jerusalem. They find him in the temple. He's teaching. And Joseph and Mary are just kind of like, do you, get, do you know what you've done? And here's what Jesus' response was. Verse 49. Why were you looking for me? He says, did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And then Luke adds these words. He says, and they did not understand the saying that he had spoken to them. But notice the very end. Verse 51, and his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. That down the road, Mary begins to think about, back about these things. And she's storing these up. And this is what I'm praying that we will ponder about today. That this, as, that as special as this little baby was, and as great as it is to hear the story of Christmas, this is not the end. For this baby grew to become a man who would live a perfect life and he would take on your sin and he would take on my sin and he would take it to the cross and die for every single one of us. This baby was born to die. And I wonder how many times are we left in wonder? How many times are we left in awe? How many times are we left admiring him? How many times are we pondering what God has done for us? And again, friends, if you're here today and you have yet to embrace this gift, I wonder, will you hear the message of the shepherd's proclamation again? That everything that was told to them was true. That the Savior of the world has come. And he came to reveal the glory of God. He came for you. He came for me. And will you hear the message and respond by embracing it today? But I pray for those of us who have. But once again, we will take this message and we will store it up in our hearts and we will treasure it. One of wonder, one of awe, one of storing this message in our hearts. Or are we dismissing it? As Well, this is what we've heard. I mean, many of us have memorized Matthew chapter 1 and 2, Luke chapter 2. We've memorized these words. But does it leave us in wonder again? Because I believe that as it does, it leads us to point number three. And here's point number three. As we declare the message of Christmas, we praise and glorify God. We praise and glorify God. I don't, know, I don't know how long it took for the shepherds to finally get up and leave the stable. You know, I don't know how many times maybe they took a look back once just to see if they could maybe see the baby just one more time before they went out of sight. But from Luke's account, we do know what they did after they left. Because verse 20 tells us these words. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all that they had seen as it had been told them. As it had been told them. I love, see, I love the response of people when God's at work. I think again about Matthew, or Acts chapter 4, as Peter and John are released, we read again in verse 23 and 24, when, when they meet up with the brothers and sisters, it says, when they had been released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said, and when they heard it, here's what they said, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them. When they heard what God was doing, people worshipped God in prayer. They not only worshipped him when they were released, but also we think about the fact that when people, when healing takes place, the people declare the greatness of God. Matthew chapter 9, verse 8. After the healing of the paralytic man, these words are written, when the crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God who had given such authority to men. When men and women gave their lives to Christ, we read in Acts 21, 19 to 20. I love this one. As, P- as Paul is relating what happened with the Gentiles, after greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done amongst the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God. As we reflect on the Christmas story, what is our response today? 
Are we praising and glorifying God? Are we praising and glorifying God not just in this building? See, this is what I love about the shepherds, is that they didn't just praise and glorify God in the stable. What does it say? It says, no, when they returned home, they were praising and glorifying God. And so let me ask us this morning, as we move out of this place, as we return home, as we're at school, as we're at the workplace, as we are just doing our everyday things, are we praising and glorifying God for all that he has done? Again, as Bach says, as believers... We belong to a great train of witnesses spanning the ages who have lifted their voices and offered their souls in gratitude for what this birth meant. Are we lifting them? Is this us? Because of what this birth meant? One of the greatest hymn writers, even through her great difficulties with her life, wrote a song as Fanny Crosby declared these words, and I truly believe the heartbeat of her life, when she said, to God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life in atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Anybody know the last line? Say that again. Do you believe that? This morning, right now, do you believe that God hath done great things? Are we worshiping him? I think about the ben- closing of our, about the benediction that I often use as we close our services on Sunday morning, and it comes out of the book of Jude, and here's what... Here's what, uh, here's what said there. It says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. That's, what's God, that's what God's done. Now listen to what the response is. To the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. What's our response to what God has done? As he, is prepa- as he is presenting us blameless before the presence of his glory, what's our response? As he has brought us from death to life, what is our response? Friends, does our worship declare the message of Christmas? Do our hearts reflect the glory and the praise of God? Or are we simply just doing that here? I hope not. And I hope that not, not for just your lives, but I hope that for my life, that when I return home, And I know I live two blocks away. But I can do a whole lot of praise in between here and there. And I can do a whole lot more in my house as well. My whole life is it about the aspect of worship. We talked about that a few weeks ago. That worship is not an event. But worship is a lifestyle. The shepherds wondered. They couldn't hide it. Told everyone in sight. All were amazed when they heard how God came down on this glorious night. I hear the angels singing, let the earth receive her king. I love that, I love that love, I know that love has come. Sing it out. Jesus Christ is born. Friends, as we bring this Advent series to a close, creation has announced the arrival of Christ and is looking forward to the second return. The angels have declared that Christ was born. The shepherds has declared that Christ has come. It's now our job. It's now our calling to sing it out. To shout it out that Jesus Christ is born. I think of the words of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23a, where Paul says, For Jews demand signs and Greeks seeks wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Friends, are we declaring the message of Christmas? Are we proclaiming the witness of Christ? Are we pondering this message? And are we worshiping him every day, not just on Christmas? God has given us a message And God has given us a great message to declare. God hath done great things. Will we join creation and angels in this great and amazing declaration? Shall we pray?